This morning we're continuing on the, the, the Advent Conspiracy Journey. You might not have heard of it before. You might have heard of it last year. You might need a little bit of reminding of it. We're just going to play a little video that tells you all about it right now. as we approach your word, I pray that you'll open our hearts and our eyes and our ears to receive as you speak to us. Lord, speak in the midst of the chaos. Speak in the midst of the rush so that we might hear you, that we may focus on you and receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So there was a farmer who was a turkey breeder and he had spent many years developing his turkeys and breeding them and then finally he, he said to his family, I have created the ultimate turkey. I have created the best turkey ever. It has six legs. And the family were like, ooh, fantastic. What will he taste like? He said, I don't know, I can't catch it. <laughs> how, many of us, how many of us are at the point just now where we are rushing about like mad people? How many of us have, have got so much things on our to-do list that we need to create a to-do list to do our to-do list? If you're, if you're like my wife, she has finished her Christmas shopping she finished her Christmas shopping in September 
I know there's something not quite right there. Um, we will be seeking counselling on that. But if you're like me, then you've probably not started. And, and you're, you're just zooming about and you, you think, I need to get that, I need to do this, I need to do that. And amongst it all, you are missing the point. I, I, I sometimes feel like that pretty much all the time about Christmas. But, but I know that God is constantly, constantly nudging and pulling and drawing us back to what it's all about. Normally on the second week of Advent, we, we celebrate John the Baptist. John who was, was out in the wilderness. And we remember that he quotes from Isaiah 40 when he says, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make flat the roads in the desert. Prepare a way for the king. And as we think on those words, we need to realize that, that he's saying the same thing to us today that he's calling each one of us to prepare the way of the Lord, to open our hearts, to prepare space, to give, to spend less, to worship fully. That's what this conspiracy is all about. And, and in my more cynical, curmudgeon days, I think that we get lied to all the time. When you look at social media, when you see everything that's going on in the, in the news and all that stuff, I think we get lied to consistently. And, and I think too often we, we don't notice. It kind of seeps in like osmosis that we need to get more stuff, that we need to get more things that will make us happy. We need to do more things that will make us content. And too often we waste our time, our effort, and our money. Do you know there was a market and research report quite a few years ago that said that companies should target two-year-olds, should target two-year-olds through adverts and, you know, when they're watching their iPads or the TV, they should target them and get them to nag, get them to nag their parents and their grandparents and to be persistent. This, this is for two-year-olds, but this is the kind of attitude. Get them while they're young. And they'll be yours for life. The world around us is telling us all the time that we need to make sure, one, our kids, our grandkids, have everything that they want. Maybe not what they need, but everything they want. And give it as much as possible and spend as much as we can. And it's a lie that we let in because we don't even notice it. Richard Foster, in his book, Freedom of Simplicity, says that the media is actually a rival religion to inflame our desire for the products they push. Have you ever thought about what really influences your buying habits? And Jesus speaks into this. Jesus speaks into this for us today when he says in John chapter 10, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. Let me give you one example. How often and how long have you spent time wanting a new phone? Let's use a phone for example. How, how much time and energy have you spent scouring the websites for that perfect phone? And then you get it and you think, wow. And then about two months later you go, actually I think I need a new phone. And then if you're, if you're Apple iPhone, there are others available. But if you do that, you, 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 get, you get your phone and then they release a new one. It's exactly the same, but with a different name. What's that all about? How does that happen? The thing is, it's not inherently wrong. It's not inherently wrong how much we, well, maybe it is, how much we lust after it. But these things in themselves are not wrong. But maybe how much time, effort, money and energy we spend on them is wrong. So Jesus speaks into this from John chapter 10. Let's read the first 10 verses. Very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. 
The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought them all out, brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen. So the context of this passage is that the the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, were unwilling to recognize who Jesus is. And at the end of this, at the end of this passage, they actually want to kill him again and he evades them. But as he speaks about being the shepherd in the first section of this passage, we have the picture of a pen and the gatekeeper standing there. And it is the shepherd. So in in this pen, there's all sorts of sheep. There's all sorts of goats. There's a whole pile of them. All the shepherds would would chuck them in there. They'd probably maybe go for a cup of tea or whatever it is shepherds did in those days. And then they would come back and then the gatekeeper would open the gate and the shepherd would call. He would call. I don't know if he had names for the sheep, but as he called out, the sheep would come out of the crowd. His sheep would follow him because they know his voice. And the thieves and the robbers would not be able to do that. So they would have to sneak in another way, try and cajole them and and try and get them out in another way. And in the same way, you and I are sheep. I I, I know this this is a struggle. We always struggle with this one when we hear it. We're sheep, we're stupid, we're, 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 we're dumb, we just follow everyone else. Is that, is that how it works? We are sheep. But in Jesus' day, sheep were vital to the shepherd. But also they were valued pets. He would have names for them all. He would know their differences. He would be able to spot them in a crowd of sheep. I'm not sure how that works, but it's how it is. And the shepherd knew them. He was with them day and night. And he knows their name. The thief will not know your name. The thief will not know who you are. You'll be labeled. You'll be labeled by whatever it is that people think can shape you. But Jesus knows your name. Do you ever... ever, do you ever get that phone call at, at five o'clock at night? You're just sitting down to your stovies, you're just away to eat, and the phone rings, and, and, and you have to answer the phone because the, the phone rings, so you've got to go and answer it. You answer it, and someone says, ah, hello, Mr. Mac, how are you doing? And you're like, uh, hello, hello, I'm just eating my stovies, I'm all right. <laughs> it's Keith, isn't it? It's Keith, Keith Mac, is that your name? I'm, I'm like, yes, you know my name. How do you know my name? Would you be interested in our double glazing or kitchen? (laughs) Click. The difference between a stranger knowing your name and a friend calling your name (laughs) is huge. You know the difference. You know the difference when someone who does not know you calls you by name. You're like, wait a minute. This is not right. But when a true friend comes and says, hey, Keith, how you doing? You're delighted. You're delighted that someone who you, who love and care for you, knows who you are. And the same is true of our Lord. He's the one that truly knows you and me. If you look at Luke chapter 12, it says that God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows who you are. He delights in who you are. In Psalm 139, David tells us that when we were being formed in our mother's womb, God knew us. God knows us from the beginning, from where we began. And Jesus knows our true name. 
In verses 4 to 6, he knows who you are, and we know his voice. And it's true, isn't it? We do know his voice. It's usually a nudge. It's usually not a shout. It's usually not a big call. It's usually a gentle nudge. And you know it's him. And you have to respond. You've probably had it this week. You've just had a real sense that God has just been nudging you. And you need to respond. Because he knows your name. And you know his voice. Revelation 3 verse 20. I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sit with him. That's what Jesus says. That he is there. He's talking. And we need to listen. You know, there are people in this world whose job it is, is to spot counterfeit money. One of their jobs is to spot counterfeit money. Be it coins, be it notes, their job is to identify the fakes. And how do they identify the fakes? Well, they study the real thing. They get to know the real thing, so they know it inside and out. They, they get the weight, they get the texture, they get the color, they get the look. They know the real thing, so that when a counterfeit comes up, they can spot it immediately, because they know what is real. And in a very real sense, God is saying the same thing to us. In this world where we're called to spend so much, he actually says to us, focus on me Focus on who I am, and you will find what is of value and what is of worth. And the best defense against the thief, the robber, the enemy, is to know God more, to dive more into his word, to connect with him in prayer, and to connect with believers here in this place and throughout the week to encourage, equip, and bless each other. Because God wants us to have life in all its fullness. The 10, 10 life. John 10, 10. Life in all its fullness. He calls us to live a life of fullness, of abundance that's only found in him. For he is the gate and he is the shepherd. That means not only is he the shepherd who calls them out, but in the second part of this passage he says he's also the gate. And if he was on his own in the wilderness, the shepherd, he would have to lie down in front of the pen to give his life, to protect. And if he says that he is the gate as well as the shepherd, it means he's going to lead us and he's going to protect us. And I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. So what do we do with this? What do we do? Well, if someone asked you what you spend your non-essential money, what you spend your money on non-essentials, the stuff that you don't really need, how much money do you spend on that? To give you an example, if you work for 40 years, earning about £30,000 a year, by the, the accumulative total, by my maths, is £1.2 million. And you're responsible for that. Some will be more, some will be less. But you're responsible for that. And what are you using it for? At Christmas, when so much goes on, we need to recognize that with what we've been given, we can make a real difference. We can make a real difference. To go back to Richard Foster, he says that we have to come but this word called thingification. Thingification. We have to combat thingification. What does that mean? Well, the, the, the desire of stuff. And he says these words. You need to revolt against the propaganda. See what they're doing and call it out. You also need to experiment. You need to ask God his will before you buy. Have you ever done that? I've been in guitar shops looking at beautiful guitars and realizing that I could get this. The credit card limit is okay. I'm covered. I could get this. And then I've just heard this, felt this wee nudge saying, not for you, son. Not for you. But maybe you've felt that as well. Or maybe we should be taking that pause before we're going to buy that stuff. 
How about quality of life, not quantity? How many times have you been in a restaurant and you've looked around, or maybe you've been, you've been that couple yourselves, you've been looking around and you've seen them looking at their phones, not talking to each other. You've never done that, have you? No, it's, it's never been you. Develop relationships, not followers. Buy for usefulness, not status. How many of us have bought that sale item because it is so much cheaper and we do not need it? It's a bargain. It's a bargain. It's on sale, half price. And there was no way you'd ever buy that decorative toilet roll holder, ever. But it was on sale. Simplicity. Simplicity at Christmas. That is what we're looking for. To make a difference with the resources that we have. Max Lucado tells a story of a chap who was unmarried and he was a slob. He was a slob. He was one of these guys who said, well, what's the point of making a bed because you're just going to sleep in it again at night. What's the point of putting the top on the toothpaste because you're just going to use it again at night? What is the point of lifting up that towel for the bathroom floor because you're just going to use it the next day? There's no point. He had pizza boxes up high. And there was cans of Coke everywhere. Eventually, he got a fiancé and, and they got married. And he was fully intending just to carry on the way he was, he was always living. And she said, well, that's fine, you can carry on that way, but you'll be sleeping on the couch every night. So eventually he began to change. He began to pick up the wet bath towel. He began to put his dirty socks inside out, outside in, back into the laundry basket. He began to be tidy. And then his wife was going on holiday for a week. He was going to be in the house on his own, and he thought, brilliant, I can do what I like. She's not going to notice. And within a day, he noticed that his bed was not made and he had to make it. He noticed the towel on the floor and he had to pick it up. He had to do the dishes straight away. And he discovered that he had found a better way to live. He couldn't go back to the old ways. Jesus calls us to a better way. Jesus calls us to the best way. And we can never go back. So here's the thing. Will you buy one last gift? Could you make a gift rather than spend that money on a gift? Could you spend time with someone rather than giving them a useless present? Could you give of your presence and not presents? We went to Bethlehem just a couple of weeks ago. We went into Palestine through the wall. We went to the Church of the Nativity. I, I, had, I had gone to the, the actual site the previous time we were in, in, in the Holy Land. Uh, so I was quite happy not to queue for two hours to get to the, 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 the spot where they think Jesus was born. But some of, our, some of our group did, and some of them are here today. And you would think, you're going to see the birthplace of Jesus. This is going to be a calm, relaxing atmosphere. We were sitting and having a coffee, waiting for them outside, and Davy came back and I said, how was it? Oh, oh, nearly had a fight. <laughs> Davy had to bring out all his, his bouncer duties to protect the ones that was with him because everyone was jamming in, pushing in, desperate to get in through the queues. And eventually they got there, but I think the, the experience of, of the queue almost took away from being at the spot of the birthplace of Jesus. Is Christmas like that for you today? In all the hustle and the bustle and the fighting and the grappling and the, all that stuff, could you set it down? Could you lay it down? And come again to the manger. But actually recognize that the manger is empty. And if you come to the cross, recognizing that the cross is empty. And if you come to the tomb, recognizing that the tomb is empty. Because God 
came in Jesus Christ. Jesus went back to the Father. But Emmanuel means that he is with us all the time. He's here and he calls us to live a different way. Can we do it? So our challenge, our challenge for this Advent Conspiracy is to buy a bed and to save a life. And we've got a wee video, it's five minutes long, so just get comfy, get the, the popcorn if you wish. Um, but we're going to just watch this video to see how we can make a difference. been treated badly all your life. Being treated well makes a big difference. They're not folk to be just ignored and walk past. These are folk to be treasured and treated really, really well. I'm so excited to be part of the care shelter. I absolutely love it. It's wonderful to see so many different volunteers from different churches mobilizing around wanting to put love into action and seeing people's lives transformed. I just feel that it's nice to be able to, when you're in a fortunate position, to be able to help somebody like that. People are less fortunate than yourself. It could be you or I who are in that position. They've been labelled all their life that they'll never amount to nothing. But we want to encourage guys constantly in here that that's not the case, that they're loved. Volunteers are, are so important for the care van. The entire project wouldn't exist without them. We're doing this because we've been loved by God first and we want to pass that love on. That's really what distinguishes us from other places. It's the presence of God and people come into real love. My father My life is on the up, you know, I'm in Bethany Christian Centre in recovery, recovering from alcohol and drugs. Um, and I'm just um, doing the programme and praising the good Lord. I'm thankful. In my time working with Bethany, right from the off really, my eyes have been opened just to the reality of each person having value before God that their worth is actually unfathomable. Well, I've spent the last three winters in the care shelter, and if I hadn't have been care shelter, I'd have been sleeping rough. And I was, I've slept, uh, I was coming up three years, I've been on the street, and I've slept every summer outside, and the shelter's been a great thing, it really has. Between both the service users and the staff that uh, are here, there's a, a sense of inclusion that's you can look around and all of a sudden you realise, well, I'm not in this situation by myself. So, yeah, a sense of inclusion and friendliness more than anything. At least when you're out the cold, you're out the cold, plus you've got security over your head. You can, nobody's going to come and assault you or anything like that when you're in here. That's a good thing about it, security. In all circumstances, each person has to be treated afresh and, and supported afresh and shown love that doesn't judge them afresh. So behind each story there's so many different facets and so many different range of needs. But we know I need not tremble. He's telling us to serve a people group who are lost and we do that through the practical outworking. I know whatever my path I'm not alone. I just want to emphasise so much the impact of people coming together, seeking to serve God, carrying the same heartbeat, the same mission, the same sense of we're serving people in, in desperate need, but we're doing it with the same love that God has shown us, and we're seeking to treat each one with compassion and with mercy. So our challenge again is to spend less on ourselves and give to others. Our 
Christmas services we'll be having the collections where we're going to ask you to buy a bed to save a life. £21. £21. If you can give that at our services then, or before, that would be wonderful. Let's pray. Slow us down, Lord, this Advent, so that we may understand the darkness that we are in, the darkness of fear that comes with wanting more, and the fear that we somehow have less. Grant us the light of transformation as we wait for your true abundance. Renew our love for the Incarnation, a love that brings dignity and security, a love that embraces and enriches and calls us to share justly and celebrate joyfully. In your precious name we pray.